So this course, we're going to talk over the next two hours. We're going to look at the FDA's Bioresearch Monitoring Program guidance that came out September 15, 2021. You guys have already given me great insight as to what exactly you're looking for. And we're going to think foundationally. So when we look at this guidance that came out, well, really kind of more of a guideline or SOP, if you will, for FDA inspectors, we have some changes than what we saw in the past from the guideline that was put out in 2010, I believe. So when we look at this, what we're going to talk about, or I think it was updated in 2017, regardless, we have some changes. And the focus here is really looking at safety and data management. And the biggest risk that a sponsor has to a regulatory agency is ensuring that they can support safety and efficacy data, the integrity of that data. Now, of course, you guys are working in a different situation. You have maybe an FDA-regulated product. You're going to be responsible for these regulations that this guideline covers. And then, of course, you're going to have the common rule as well. So when I talked about looking at foundationally at what the sponsor is required to have in place, we always look when we go and do a mock inspection or an audit, you know, is this sponsor established to be able to meet their regulatory obligations? So Sponsor quality systems are really a significant focus. ICHE 6 R2, Section 5 talks about this, that we really need to have a plan in place. Because remember, a sponsor is kind of like that first pebble in a pond, if you will. And I still pond, and we throw that pebble in there. Hey, we're going to do research. And that pebble has ripple effects. So if we're throwing out a lousy protocol, if we don't have good criteria for selecting our investigators and our monitors, that's going to translate to not getting good data from protected participants, to not meeting those goals for good clinical practice. So it starts with the sponsor. We want to make sure that they have everything that they need to translate out quality. So within this guideline, we're going to focus on these different elements of a sponsor's quality subsystems. So the quality system for a sponsor is to make sure that they are protecting participants who are involved in their study and ensure that the data that's collected is credible, the safety and efficacy data. So we're going to start out talking at foundationally. Are you structured to be able to do your work? With whom are you connecting? Who are you outsourcing your services? You know, to whom are you outsourcing those services? How do you monitor? What do your monitors do? When do they monitor? What are their qualifications? How do you move data around? How do you ensure that safety is maintained? How do you control your investigational product? And then how do we document everything? Any questions so far? You can just go ahead and give me a green check if you're good to move forward or feel free to ask those questions. Perfect, thanks. So buy more programs. Our programs are established to make sure that, at a minimum, we followed FDA regulations, that people are protected, that our data is credible. Just as I mentioned earlier, that's really our product of GCP. And it's really what we're looking for end run. You know, our product is to make sure we're protecting the public's health. We all work towards getting products out there that are safe and effective that clinicians can use to treat, diagnose, you know, ameliorate any sort of issue that that patient might have. So the FDA talks about sponsor responsibilities. They're going to inspect what they expect, and they give us information about what their expectations are, right? the regulations at a bare minimum. So you're responsible for initiating, taking responsibility for those clinical studies of our drug or biologic products, of course, medical devices as warranted need to make sure that informed consent is obtained in accordance with 21 CFR 50. If we're working in a pediatric population, we also need to have plans in place for subpart D. We have to look at any electronic records that are being used. If they are generating data, if they're moving data, if they're transmitting data, you know, creating it, storing it, archiving it, what have you, then if those are regulatory documents, meaning that they're needed to support our application, then we need to ensure that those systems are compliant with 21 CFR 11. And we're going to talk more about that, too. And then, of course, anything specific to any other element of what we fall under, 45 CFR, 46, for example, we discussed. But 42 CFR 11 is part of good clinical practice. As I'm sure you're aware, 
clinicaltrials.gov sits within the National Library of Medicine. NIH gave FDA authority to review compliance with this a few years ago. Last year, we got our first letters, those notifications of noncompliance. Two sponsors, three sponsors received those letters where the FDA cited that they had not been maintaining their page. They had not been maintaining the information about their applicable clinical trials. So there are certain things within that regulation. There are things that need to be updated in 30 days, things that need to be updated in 15 days. And there's significant civil and monetary penalties for failing to do so because, of course, that is a patient-facing portal. That's part of the transparency we have in clinical research. When we have that applicable clinical trial, we have to post it within 21 days of the first subject being enrolled. We have to ensure that we're maintaining it. We have to ensure that when we get those results, we submit those results along with our protocols and statistical analysis plans because that's how we give other researchers insight into what we achieved. 